Hello and welcome to a special edition of History Pod that's being recorded live in front of a small crowd of inquisitive antiquarians in the Derbyshire town of Buxton as part of the Buxton Festival Fringe. If you're a regular listener to the podcast, you'll know that as the writer of History Pod, I've released a daily On This Day in History episode every day since April 2015. That's an awful lot of episodes, and I'm very, very grateful to everybody who listens, subscribes, rates, and reviews the podcast. If you haven't rated or reviewed, please consider doing so. Now, my decision to launch this podcast came from my desire to weave a slightly richer tapestry of world history than the one that is often portrayed. The world has a tendency to ignore those events that aren't immediately recognisable in some way, And this problem, I think, is compounded by what I've started to refer to as the buzz feeding of history through top 10 lists that make the rounds on social media. Considering the internet has the ability to contain all human knowledge, I find it rather depressing that the same few well-known facts keep being repeated to the detriment of almost everything else that has ever happened. Now, of course, in terms of history, there are some events, the Battle of Hastings, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the invention of the World Wide Web, all of these had an enormous effect on our world, and most of us know the stories behind them. However, there are millions of other pieces of the past that are less well remembered, and through History Pod, what I try to do is to balance this well known popular history with some of the smaller stories that I think deserve to have a greater role in our memories. Whether it was the invention of sliced bread, or the day that Lewis Carroll told the story of Alice in Wonderland whilst sailing down the River Isis, these events have had a huge impact on our world, even if we don't know their origins. These stories are all part of a broader tapestry of the past that are often just as illuminating as the more major events of history. I like to think that they're like the small chinks of light that illuminate a room through the threadbare curtains that we pulled across in the hope of keeping it in the dark. Now, last December, I had the privilege to launch my book based on this podcast at the Anthony Frost English Bookshop in Bucharest in Romania. The Anthony Frost English Bookshop didn't gain its name from the owner or from an academic or indeed from an author. Anthony Frost wasn't a critic or a playwright or a poet. He was a truck driver. After the communist regime of Nicolae Ceausescu fell in 1989, Anthony Frost led one of the very first aid convoys from Britain to Romania, where, by chance, he met a man called Vlad, struck up a friendship, and a few years later, Vlad opened the very first English bookshop in the country. He chose to name the shop after Anthony Frost because of the huge impression that he'd made on his life. And so this charitable British truck driver who doesn't feature in any of the histories recounting the end of the communist regime in Romania now has a shop named after him in the city. And by recording his story, Anthony Frost did indeed become part of that history. Now even the very place where we're gathered to record this special live edition of History Pod tells a fascinating social history. Built in 1898, this building was originally a tobacconist's. The shop later became Salt's Antiques in the 1950s, which in itself seems a little bit strange considering things from the 1950s and 60s when it was operating as an antique shop now find themselves in antique shops. That's the vagaries of time and history. It changed hands two more times, firstly to a toy shop and then it became a factory clothing store for a few years before in 1998, becoming what it is now, uh, probably one of the best second-hand and antiquarian bookshops in the whole country. Now, like the stories told by these two bookshops, I hope that the mix of events that make up HistoryPod help to prove that something worth remembering happened every day of the year. But this leads us to probably the most common question that I get asked. Just how does one choose one daily historical event to focus on at the expense of all of the others? This is where we can turn to Billy Joel, because when writing his 1989 hit song, We Didn't Start the Fire, he needed to make these decisions. 
That song is his attempt at telling the history of the world that he'd grown up in through a broadly chronological list of about 120 different events, inventions and personalities. Harry Truman, Doris Day, Red China, Johnny Ray, South Pacific, Walter Winchell, Joe DiMaggio, John McCarthy, Richard Nixon, Studer, Baker, Television, North Korea, South Korea, Marilyn Monroe. Now the first thing that probably jumps out to you about the lyrics of we didn't start the fire, is that Billy Joel's view of the modern world is dominated by America. But on reflection, that shouldn't really be much of a surprise, because we're all affected by what's referred to by academics as cultural and geographical proximity, where we're likely to assign significance to those things that have tangibly affected our existence, or at least those things that have similarity to aspects of the life that we live. Well, Billy Joel grew up in the Bronx in the 1950s, so it's only sensible that his choices should reveal an interest in baseball and pop music, cinema and the arts, alongside maybe the major international political events that he was aware of as a child. Through the rest of the song, these other 120-ish historical events, Billy Joel tells a story of his world. But it's really important to emphasise that it's his world. This is his interpretation of the past. This is his view of the history that matters. He is casting his own judgments of what we refer to as historical significance. Well, the case is similar with History Pod, because while I make a really conscious effort to write and to record about a diverse range of events, it's important that I'm able to explain the event's historical significance within the three minutes that each daily episode lasts. My own ability to judge an event's significance and then to explain it in a clear and accessible way assumes that I already have some knowledge and understanding of the context of the event. In practice, it's often therefore sometimes easier to just write about a relatively modern Western event rather than one from a culture or a period of history of which I have little or no knowledge. But assessing historical significance also then relies on personal judgment, just as it did with Billy Joel. And as a history teacher, I've seen many criteria that have been proposed to be able to do this, but they all draw back on the work of a great pedagogue called Geoffrey Partington, who proposed these criteria. So he says that for something to be historically significant, it should fulfill as many of these criteria as possible. Firstly, it must have been remarked upon by people at the time. If people at the time didn't realise that it was important, then it probably wasn't. Secondly, it needed to have had a major effect on people at the time or since. Third, it needed to have affected a lot of people's lives. Fourth, it must have endured in some way. And the fifth one, which is maybe the most contentious one, is that for something to be historically significant, it needs to be relevant to our lives today. And clearly, our lives are different to what they're going to be in 50 years time or what they were 50 years ago. So it raises the question as to whether historical significance shifts over time, whether something that was important to one group of people stops being important later on. Well, the events that I'll be talking about in History Pod will always fit at least one of these different factors regarding judgments of historical significance. But of course, they've also got to be an event that can be verified as happening on a particular day. Well, the fact that our modern world is dominated by the Romano Christian calendar means that some historic cultures and regions of the world are dramatically underrepresented in the History Pod podcast because we simply don't know the precise modern equivalent date that events occurred on. If we take the pre-Islamic Arabian Peninsula as an example, the Muslim calendar has existed since what we call the 7th century. But it wasn't for another 400 years that Islamic astronomers were able to successfully align the start date of the Islamic calendar to a fixed date on the Western Julian calendar that was in use by the rest of Europe at the time. To make things even more complicated, since an Islamic month is a lunar month and can therefore vary in length depending on the observations of the moon, Arab scholars had to create their backdated calendar by creating what's called a tabular Islamic calendar, using arithmetical rules to determine the length of the months. They didn't actually know how long the months were, they were just trying to calculate it. They then projected that backwards to the foundation of the Islamic calendar 
in order to identify the equivalent date on the Julian. Now, the fact that this was a later mathematical calculation means that we know early Islamic dates are not accurate. Despite that, we accept the dates that the 12th century scholars proposed. But go back even further, back to pre-Islamic dates, it's virtually impossible to pinpoint a specific date. And so on HistoryPod, you won't find an episode predating Islam from the Arabian Peninsula. It's simply impossible for me to tie it to a particular date. So if we can only start at a certain date in the Islamic world, why are we able to do it longer in the Western world? Well, that's something that we can thank the Romans for. Virtually all modern scholars accept that the city of Rome was founded on precisely the 21st of April, 753 BC. Now, it seems completely implausible for us to know the exact date that a probably mythological character actually started to set up a city. But there's a very clear reason that that date is used. And it's all because of a Roman scholar called Marcus Terentius Varro. He backdated, again, a timeline of Roman history using a list of published Roman consuls, together with a little bit of historical license to allow for periods of dictatorial rule. He managed to then date back every single consul and every single king according to the records that they had and found that it must therefore have started on the 21st of April, 753 BC. But you'll have again seen the trap here. He used a little bit of historical license on these dates. So even the Roman calendar is inaccurate. But since nobody else has come up with a viable alternative, that's the one that we use. So the decisions over what event appears in HistoryPod is therefore uh, a little bit of personal judgment, but also a, a practical problem of trying to find an uncontested historically accurate date. Honestly, I would dearly love to talk about a wider geographical and chronological range of events in the podcast, but through trying to meet my mission statement, which is to podcast three minutes about an event that happened on that day in history, I've kind of found myself in a bit of a straitjacket. But hopefully to the listeners who have written in their droves to find out how and why I choose certain dates, hopefully that has shed a little bit of light on why that is the case. Thank you.